Hello, today is April 8th, 2021. <laughs> it's the January, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you said it right. I did, but it sounded weird. Okay, okay. sorry. Next. Hello, today is April 8th, 2021. My name is Erica Mata. I'm interviewing Maribel Mata for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley hereafter abbreviated as UTRGB. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Ms. Mata, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGB and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Specials Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGB University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to Special Collections and Archives at UTRGB. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we, we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. Do you give university library special collections and archives at UTRGB consent to archive your interview and your materials at UTRGB University Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant UTRGB University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in, copy and co in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGB University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the University Library special, special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the, in the Voices of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? Yes, I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Voices server at the University of Austin, University of Texas at Austin before Voices send it to UTRGB University Library Special Collections and Archives. We would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members so that, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGB University Library. The final two questions, ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGB University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes, I agree. On occasion, UTRGB Special Collections and Archives and voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects, we only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Thank you for, thank you for your consent. Your experiences and stories mean a lot to us at UTRGB Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you have to say in your interview questions. I will not ask. Maribel, thank you for your time. Like I said earlier, your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGB, Special Collections and Archives and the Voices Project, particularly for, particularly for us at UTRGB Special Collections. We are committed to preserving the stories of Mexican Americans and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. And those who work closely with these populations during this COVID-19 pandemic. 
because you are a high school a high school teacher who cares for the physical safety and mental well-being of her students in the community of Mission, Texas, and because you are a daughter, sister, and friend who is knowledgeable of the ways COVID-19 has affected others in her inner circle. I know you have many meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles you carry out in your life. So before I ask you to share stories about your life um, during this pandemic, tell us who is Maribel Mata? Well, I was born, I'm born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I was born in McAllen and I was raised in Donna where I graduated um, from Donna High School. And then I attended the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley where I graduated with a bachelor's degree um, in history. So I know all about um, the special collections because I'd have to go there for research. Um, and, um, you know, so then I went through an alternative certification program and I became a teacher and I have been working with Mission CISD um, for the past, for almost two years now. Um, and so I, you know, started teaching and I was halfway through my first year and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So that was, a, you know, a huge surprise. Um, especially during your first year of teaching where you're you're trying to get the hang of things. Um, so, you know, I, my experience with this has been um, unique in the sense that I get to see how it affects students and how it's still affecting students, you know, today. Um, but that's just a little bit about me. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll go ahead and ask the question. So the first question I want to ask you is, when did you first hear about COVID-19? How did you learn about it? Was it through the radio, TV, through your students, social media? So, I mean, I, I learned about COVID-19 like everyone else did for the most part through social media and through the news. And that was in early, I'm gonna say around January. Um, and, you know, teachers at school would talk about it too. Um, and I remember specifically um, this one time that we were talking in the hallway during our conference period. And one of the teachers was saying um, something, I think one of her um, relatives worked um, as a pilot and they were, you know, they were commenting on how serious this actually was because for the most part in the beginning, they were trying to dismiss it as just, oh, it's just like the cold, it's just like the flu, it's no big deal. Um, but that was the first time that I heard, you know, several accounts of where, you know, no, this is actually pretty serious and is actually pretty serious in China. And then, you know, they locked down that entire city. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. And I remember being in my classroom right before spring break let out and I was with my students. Um, and one of my students was like, bye miss. It's like, he's like, we'll see, you know, if we come back after spring break. And I was like, oh, you know, like, oh, it's fine. Like whatever, like, you know, they were just messing around. And we went out for spring break and we never came back. You know, we went online and um, my boyfriend and I went to Gardner State Park that weekend, right, right after we got out for spring break. And we got there Saturday and there were still, you know, whispers about the pandemic and how it was already being confirmed cases here in Texas. And, um, the next day, Garner, well, Garner usually has these dances in the pavilion. Um, and we had attended the dance Saturday night. And then when we were leaving Sunday night, we heard the girls in the gift shop saying that they had canceled um, you know, any future dances and they were starting to restrict um, a lot of other things. And that's when it became real. And then of course, that spring break, everything just started to shut down and unravel. Um, so it was very interesting to watch it unfold and to kind of, you know, there were just different steps to it. And we kind of overlooked it a lot in the beginning. 
And then it finally reached home and we were like, whoa, this is serious. So that was um, very interesting to, to see. And it's still something I vividly remember. What was your first reaction to the information about COVID-19? Um, I mean, I think I'm naturally I am a pretty, I'm a pretty careful person. Um, I also have, you know, some anxiety over uncertainty, which this is what it was. You'd hear so many different mixed messages from so many people and from the media and, you know, social media. Um, and I didn't know what to believe and I didn't know how to feel at first. I'd be like, oh, it's just like the flu. It's just like the cold. It's no big deal. And then I get scared. And it was just, it was literally just like a roller coaster of emotions for me. Um, but initially I remember just thinking, well, you know, it'll probably be fine. It'll probably be just like the swine flu that I remember, you know, when I was in, in high school um, and it'll be fine. It, it won't be a big deal. You know, this will blow over in a few weeks. Um, so I think part of me was just hoping that it wasn't anything major, anything that, you know, um, could affect us in, in such a serious way. So part of me was trying to hold on to hope that it, that it was just like the swine flu and it wasn't going to affect us um, in such a, a, a negative way. Not, not that I'm saying that the swine flu didn't affect people in a negative way because it did, but it wasn't, it did not reach the scale that COVID-19 did. At what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life altering event or did you not think it was serious at all? Um, I've, I think even when we went into lockdown, part of me wanted things to be normal. Um, so I was like, okay, we'll go into lockdown, we'll wear masks. Um, and then you know, I, even when I saw people at the store, you know, rushing to buy toilet paper and waters, I was like, this, this is ridiculous. Um, once I started seeing the death toll go up, um, that's when it started to really um, affect me in a serious way, because it was something like we'd never seen before. And I think it was when I saw what was going on in New York um, and how they were having to put, you know, the bodies in um, the trailers because they did not have any space for, you know, the deceased. And that is when it really started to freak me out. Before, I just always hoped that, you know, it was something that, people could overcome, but I think the issue there was that everyone was getting sick and it was, this was very new to us and hospitals were just overflowing. And that's really when it started to, to scare me, especially um, when it hit here in the Valley and what was happening in New York was happening here, which is, which was bizarre to me because we're such a small, not that the valley's tiny, but compared to New York City or Boston or Los Angeles or Seattle, you know, these major cities, we're small compared to them. So when it hit home here, that's when I was like, okay, this is scary. This is real. And then of course, when my parents got it, you know, that was also pretty terrifying, not knowing what was going to happen. Over the last few months, what news media, social media, or other sources did you rely on to keep you informed about the coronavirus? Um, so I, I've been on Twitter for, I've been on Twitter since I was a senior in high school. So it's been almost 11 years since I was a senior in high school. 
Um, so I've been on Twitter since then. So that's where I get my news um, through the trending um, topics. So that's, you know, that's usually what I use. Um, so I would say social media for, you know, for sure, because I'm not, I don't watch the news. Um, we have, you know, our entire lives on our phone and it's so easy to access the news from there. So social media for sure. Can you share with me what you understand about um, COVID-19 as an infectious disease and any of its variant, any of its variants? So the variants are still pretty new to me. Um, to be honest, I haven't done much, much research on it. Um, and they're still pretty new to, to a lot of people. But uh, my understanding of COVID-19 is that it is an infectious disease and it is transmitted through um, the uh, water particles or the you know, your saliva, your spit. So if you sneeze or you cough, um, you know, it's something that if you touch your mouth, if you touch your nose, or if you touch your eyes, you can become infected with, um, you know, and everyone battles it differently. I, you know, some people are a lot more, get a, get a lot more of a severe case than others. Some people have mild or, you know, they're asymptomatic. Um, and then there's people, you know, who also have un underlying conditions that, you know, they would not be able to fight off COVID-19. So I, I would say I know the, you know, basic things that, you know, most people know and how, you know, you can get it and how to protect yourselves from it. Um, and, you know, that's about it. I don't, um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I do wear my mask, you know, everywhere I go, I take my little bottle of hand sanitizer. Um, you know, I have disinfectant um, at home and at school. So I try to take the proper measures and try not to touch my face um, when I'm out and about. So that's, that's as much as, as I know. Can you tell me about what you know about the various vaccines available to the public? How do you feel about these vaccines? Well, I just got my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine last Wednesday. Um, so I'm definitely for the vaccine. Um, myself and my family members have gotten it. Um, my parents are getting it soon. Um, and I know that there's three different kinds of vaccines. Moderna and Pfizer, two doses, and um, the Johnson & Johnson is just one dose. And they all have different, um, you know, a certain percentage that they can protect you from a serious infection. So it doesn't mean that you can't get COVID even after you've gotten your vaccine. It just means that the likelihood of you having to end up in the hospital with a severe case of COVID is greatly diminished. So I'm all for the vaccine. Do your family members hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19 or do some of them take it ser more seriously or not as serious? I think we all, for the most part, take it pretty seriously. Um, I know my mom does. Um, I know that my dad does as well. My sister, you do. <laughs> um, my little, both of my brothers, and I don't know if it's because they're, they're boys or they're much younger. Um, I don't know, you know, why they feel that way, but um, they're a lot more lax about it. You know, they, yeah, they wear their, their masks and they use hand sanitizer, but you know, they're, they're a lot more relaxed about it for sure. Um, I would, I think that um, me, you know, yourself and mom and dad are a lot more, we take it a lot more seriously for sure than, than our younger brothers. Okay. 
for these next set of questions, I'd like to talk to you about what you've seen. Um, have you seen COVID-19 affect family members, friends, and, e and equal importance? Because you are from Donna, you are from the Donna area and Mission area. Did you have the chance to visit Corpus? And I know that you traveled um, to other places over the summer of last year. How do you compare the response to um, COVID-19 in that area of like Corpus and other places you have gone to, to what you've seen from like Donna Mission area, specifically um, Hidalgo County? Um, what was the memorable, what was memorable about your trip to Corpus during the pandemic? Um, what was it like to travel around the time of COVID? So, so I, I well, I traveled to Corpus because that's where my boyfriend lives. Um, and we spent, um, a good chunk quarantining together, um, because of course I had gone over there after spring break and then we just never went back to school um but we're traveling to corpus and from the valley especially during um you know stay at home orders the valley locked down a lot a lot faster than the corpus area did um it was when i was in corpus it took a while before they started to implement masks um you know, and then a couple of weeks later, Corpus also did a stay at home order, but it wasn't any as, as strict as it was here in the Valley. Um, when we traveled to, um, we went to Wimberley in August of last year. And, you know, it, you know, everyone was wearing masks and social distancing. So it was still the same, you know, hand sanitizer, um, social distance it, you know, they had a, a, a capacity at, you know, restaurants or, you know, certain places. Um, we, you know, wanted to go to Jacob's well and to other places you had to reserve ahead. Um, so all of those, you know, procedures and precautions are put into place. Um, when we went to Bastrop in October, that was different because it's interesting because both Wimberley and Bastrop are kind of in the hill country region area, um, but they're on opposite sides of, you know, that area or the Austin San Marcos area. But it was definitely different being in Bastrop because, you know, there some people weren't wearing masks. They definitely weren't social distancing. Um, you know, my boyfriend and I were still wearing masks because we were, we, we've been used to wearing masks and, um, you know, we had this belief that yes, COVID-19 is serious, but we also, um, in order to not just stay home and, um, kind of, you know, feel stir crazy or even get depressed, we kind of had to start going out and doing you know normal activities the state was allowing it so you know we went ahead and we you know we did as much as we could as safely as we could um but definitely when we went to Bastrop that was probably the unsafest I had felt during the pandemic just because there were people that were not taking precautions and I was like whoa this is this is new it felt really really weird because we'd been conditioned to try, you know being safe for all these months and then it was kind of like oh okay you're not wearing a mask it was just weird how did you feel about going into quarantine during the spring of 2020 can you share some memories about this time like grocery shopping um, food and item shortages yeah okay so I remember being with my boyfriend at HEB and I, this was after we got back from Garner State Park. And um, this is when, you know, things were starting to shut down and people were starting to get freaked out. And I remember going to HEB and it was like 9 p.m. And there were so many people there and everyone was just stocking up. And 
me and my boyfriend were we looked at each other and we're like what's going on like why are these people stocking up on food um and at first we were like oh you know what just let them we were just there to buy hot dogs because we were going to make chili dogs that night so we were just there to buy ingredients and then all of a sudden he turns around and he starts grabbing a bunch of cans of chili and he starts you know just grabbing a bunch of random food and I'm like what has gone into you why like I still was a little bit more relaxed and trying not to buy into all of the panic, you know, hoarding and stuff. But he started buying a bunch of, you know, and I, I specifically remember the cans of chili because we were in that section and we were making chili dogs. But I till this day, I make fun of him. And I'm like, remember that time you bought like 10 cans of chili? Like, how did that work out for you? You had to eat all most of that by yourself. And he's like, I don't regret it. I'm glad I did it. But yeah, I do remember that specifically. And it was just so bizarre. And then as the weeks went on, it, it was, I just felt like stir crazy. Like I felt mad being locked up because even though I was with my boyfriend, we were locked up in his house. We couldn't go anywhere because all the parks were shut down. What we would do um, is, you know, we'd, I'd still have to be teaching. So I'd still be teaching from home and he'd still be working from home. But I remember like around 5 p.m. But once we both stopped doing our work, we would we ended up downloading Pokemon Go. So we'd go on walks around the neighborhood and just be catching Pokemon. There was nothing we, we could not go anywhere. Like we couldn't even go to like Target or TJ Maxx just to go walk around. We couldn't do any of that. So we would just resort to walking around the neighborhood in the evenings and that's about it. And, or, or playing on the Nintendo switch, because I also, you know, bought into that of buying the Nintendo switch. So I could play animal crossing, um, which kept me entertained. So, but yeah, it was, it was definitely a frustrating time when we were locked down even when I did have to quarantine, when I got back home to the Valley and I quarantined with, with my family, we would just go from one room to the next and, you know, to the kitchen, to the living room, to the bedroom, to my mom's room and repeat. There's nowhere, you know, we could go. So it was, and, you know, forget about online shopping because, you know, I spent a lot of money on things I did not need. How has the pandemic changed the way you go out for, for social events? Um, I don't actually go out for social events. I don't think anyone has had, um, one of my friends was supposed to get married last April and that didn't work. I haven't hung out. So the people that I hang out with are my family, my boyfriend, and then well now since we went back to in person or just my coworkers that I see in the hallway. Um, but I haven't hung out with other people, uh, at least me directly. Um, we celebrated my birthday um, last month and we did go out to dinner as a family. But for the most part, yeah, no, so no big social gatherings. Um, I did travel to California though for Christmas and we were quarantined, I guess you can say, um, at my boyfriend's mom's house on Huntington Beach. So that's about it for the most part. I stay in my apartment during the weekend. On the weekends, I go visit, you know, my mom and or my boyfriend, but um, I haven't gone to bars or clubs and that not that that's my scene anyway but if that's what you're referring to social yeah no or no quinceaneras no weddings no birthday parties no you know things like that did you contact COVID-19 or do you know anyone who did contact COVID-19 I don't know if I ever contacted COVID-19 and if I did it was definitely asymptomatic so to this day, I, I, I don't know. Um, I do know, you know, a few people, a few, few family members who did um, contract COVID-19. Um, my dad was the first one in our family to contract, contract it. And it was um, 
from work, he, he works out of the Valley. He works in, um, in Menard and some of the coworkers there were feeling sick. And so everyone got tested and my dad started feeling sick too. And he got tested that day that, that morning, that same day he can't, he drove back home to the Valley and he was like, I'm going to quarantine in the guest house because my parents have a guest room in the back. Um, and he, I remember he got off his work truck and he went straight to the guest room, which my mom had already set up for him. So we didn't have any contact with him. Um, cause at the time I was still living with them. Um, so he was the first person to, you know, that I, that was close to me to get sick. And that was definitely pretty terrifying because I was seeing all of these things in the news and I didn't know how it was going to affect him. My dad's not old. He's still fairly young, but he, I mean, he's not, you know, a 20 year old. Um, so he is, um, he, he was, you know, th there's potential there of him, you know, of it being serious. So it was definitely scary, especially when I see, you know, I was used to seeing my dad. So full of life, always, you know, working, going up and down and him having to quarantine for like two and a half weeks was also hard on him. But I'm just very, very grateful that he was able to, you know, recuperate. And of course, my mom also after she got it after my dad, because she was taking care of my dad, she would go and, you know, give him food, we'd wear masks, but eventually, you know, that was going to happen. Hers was, um, they didn't have the same symptoms. My dad lost um, his, the taste and he had a few other symptoms that were, you know, definitely it checked off, you know, COVID-19, right? Um, but my mom had stomach issues, which at that time, during that time, there's, you know, nothing about stomach issues being uh, a COVID-19 symptom, but she also quarantined. Um, and then both of my brothers as well, um, they weren't really sure because their tests, you know, weren't positive right outright but they knew something was wrong. So they also had to take those um, precautions. Um, and then most recently, my uncle, he got it, my, my dad's brother, he got it in the beginning of this year. And he was actually in the hospital um, because, you know, low oxygen, he couldn't breathe. But luckily he also, you know, recuperated. Um, so luckily, you know, my experience my, you know, my family's experience with COVID-19, while it has been scary, um, because you just, it's very, you know, it's uncertain what's going to happen. And thankfully, you know, everyone has been okay and everyone has made a full recovery. In the pre-interview, you mentioned that your boyfriend is a PhD student. What does he study and how did um, COVID affect his research? So he is um, working on his PhD and he um, does aquaculture. So right now he's doing research on um, oysters. Um, and that's as far as I know about it. I mean, he tells me all the time, but it's sometimes it's really difficult to understand some of these um, science things. But um, his experience with that, definitely he could not go to school and do his research he was working from home, um, which was frustrating for him because he is a PhD student and he wants to, you know, get it moving. He wants to already receive his PhD and start working. So that was frustrating for him because he was not, it halted everything for him because in every, it's connected with the school. So the universities are a lot more restrictive. Um, so his, you know, he had to put that on pause. Um, he had an internship that he had to do that was scheduled to happen this year. Um, and that was going to take place in Maryland. So he was going to go away for three months this summer. However, that was canceled due to COVID-19 concerns. Um, so now he's doing that 
you know, online. So, you know, I know that was frustrating for him because he also likes to, you know, go out and travel and network with other people. And of course, being online and being there actually immersed in what you're supposed to be doing is completely different, especially when you're conducting research. Um, so yeah, there are some, there are some things that, you know, were halted completely. And some of the things like his research just started up again um, in the second half of the year. So yeah, for a couple months, he was, he was not able to do much research for his, his project. You mentioned that you traveled to Austin. Did you notice if the pandemic regulations in Austin, Texas are different than, the, than they were in the Valley? Um, for example, do, did the businesses require more masks or did more people wear masks than they did in um, the Valley? No, I think Austin is pretty strict, um, just like the Valley. Now, of course, when you go um, to the smaller towns surrounding Austin, like Bastrop um, or Lockhart, they're a lot more relaxed about it. Um, but the city of Austin, for the most part, yeah, they're, they're pretty restrict restrictive as much as the Rio Grande Valley. So there wasn't much of a difference. Same thing with Corpus. They you know, masks everywhere. But once you start traveling up north, um, that that's where, you know, or at least towards the east, towards east Texas or west Texas, it starts to get a little bit more relaxed. I know that you adopted a cat during the pandemic. Can you share with me how adopting a pet during the pandemic is any different than pre-pandemic time? Um, I, I don't think that it was any different, um, at least because I saw him, um, I adopted him from Palm Valley. So I saw him on Facebook and they had posted a picture and I saw him on Facebook and I was like, oh my God, I want that cat. And I applied for him online that same day. Um, little did I notice, so did my sister during that time I was in Corpus and, um, she applied or you applied <laughs> because, you know, she really wanted me to get this cat, you know, because I called my mom and my sister right away. I was like, I love this cat so much. I would tell my boyfriend, I was like, I love this cat so much. I need, like, I need him. I love him so much. And um, the next morning they called me and they were like, oh, you know, he's available for adoption if you want to come by. And I was like, oh, I'm two and a half hours away. Um, you know, so my sister actually is the one who had to go pick him up. Um, so I'm not sure if there was any any difference. I, from what I know, it wasn't any different. Um, but he definitely helped me or has helped me through through a lot this past year and this year. I know that you also moved out um, of the family home during the pandemic. What made you decide that that was the right time to move? Well, it wasn't the reason I had already been planning to move out since the beginning of, since I started working at Mission, just because of the commute and, you know, the traffic and I, you know, I wanted to be closer. So I had already been planning this. So the pandemic hit and, you know, that was, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not fun, but I'm still going to move. Um, so that was interesting because when I was ordering furniture, everything was delayed. Um, you know, my couch was the biggest headache ever. Um, I had initially ordered it from Ashley Furniture. They, you know, it was a disaster to say the least. So then I had to order it from a different, um, from rooms to go. And I was finally able to get a couch right before I moved in. But um yeah, all of the furniture was delayed and um, it was just interesting because then we were still online, you know, so then I was like, oh, I don't even have to commute anymore. Like I'm working from home, but it worked out at the end because I really did working from home, you know, teaching from home definitely requires um, you to be focused and 
it, you know, for it to be quiet and a very strong internet connection, which I didn't have, you know, living in, in, a, in a house with, with five other people. Um, so it still worked out and well, now I'm back in person. So, you know, shorter commute, it's only about 10 minutes to get to work for these last few months. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been good. The only thing at the beginning, the only real headache was just getting my furniture. Um, and then of course, why I adopted my cat Kip, you know, because I need, I wanted somebody to keep me company while I, you know, lived on my own for the first time. So that he really helped out as well. How is it living on your own for the first time, especially during a pandemic? It's been, it's been good. I mean, it's definitely, I've never, prior to this, I've never lived on my own ever. Um, I always lived with five other people and there was definitely quiet and it's definitely a lot more quiet. Um, but sometimes you really, you know, you do miss having that noise or, you know, having other people around. Um, so it, it, it was different, but I think it was something that, you know, is definitely necessary. And the fact that it happened during a pandemic, well, you know, it just it happened during a pandemic. I can't really say that there was much of a difference. Um, I did, you know, I have, my mom was obsessed with making sure that I had hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes, which I appreciate because now I have a lot of it and I don't have to worry about buying any, but I wasn't ever planning on having anyone over anyway, um, other than my sister when she came over to watch The Bachelor and This Is Us <laughs> on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, but, you know, it's just me and my cat the majority of the time, unless my family comes to visit or my boyfriend, but it's, it's very, you know, quiet and relaxing. So this next set of questions focuses on your stories and experiences as an educator in the time of COVID-19. How long have you been employed with Mission CISC? I've been employed with them for almost two years now. And what do you teach at Mission High School? I teach government and economics. Are you concerned about the effectiveness of online learning for educating your students? 100%. How so? A lot of students aren't online learners and it's as simple as that. They just do not do well learning online. Um, they're, you know, students, all students learn very differently. Um, there are a few who have done well, but uh, there's a few, you know, the majority of them need to be in the classroom. They need to either be working on hands-on activities um, or, you know, wat watching, you know, something visually or listening to me um, explain something on the board. I'm very limited to what I can do online. I have, you know, adopted, you know, various online resources to, help me reach them, but some of them just do not do well online and they just don't like it. They, it's easy for them to get distracted um, or just to simply get bored. Um, so yeah, it's 100% affecting students. Have you had to take on any extra work duties because of COVID-19? Mm. No, well, no, I mean, I wouldn't say extra. Um, however, reaching those students that have gone MIA, I would say just having to make extra phone calls than I was used to before when we were in person because it was a lot e easier to reach people, to reach the students. You know, they were right there in my classroom or they're in the hallway, you know, I'd be like, hey, get in here, you know, finish this assignment. Um, but, you know, when they com completely just choose not to engage online and not to join 
your Google Meet and you know, you're stuck making 70, 80 phone calls a week, you know, sometimes twice a week. So the extra work would just be having to make all those phone calls and documenting them, of course, and trying to find students. So um, yeah, that's, I would say that would be extra work. What kind of policies has Mission CISD enacted to get ahead of the disease? Mission was actually one of the first ones to decide that they were going to shut down for, you know, the rest of the school year. And they decided to open up late as well for the new school year. And we have been online, we were online the entire first semester, you know, and then they finally started letting students back on campus if the parents wanted to, you know, let them. Um, early this year, teach all of the all of staff members and all of the teachers recently, um, our first day back was on Monday. So yeah, they have been very, very restrictive and, you know, really great about making sure that we're safe, the students are safe, um, you know, they have set up vaccine clinics. They, you know, also, in, you know, testing, mass testing. So they've been really good about staying ahead. Um, but now, you know, we're slowly transitioning back to in-person, which I was ready to go back to, you know, for, I've been ready for a while now, but yeah, they've been really good about it. Um, I, you just mentioned that mission is resu resumed back in is resuming back in person teaching are you worried about your safety or have you been worried about your safety i'm in my classroom um by myself all day so i'm not worried you know i see my coworkers in the hallway and we, everyone has a mask on um I, I don't interact with many people anyway. I'm, like I said, I'm in my classroom 95% of the time, you know, working on my, on, you know, either teaching um, online or, you know, doing other work or making phone calls like I did today. Um, but no, they have been very transparent on, you know, if there was a, a suspected case or a confirmed case, you know, they we recently got an email about that actually today that there was somebody on campus who now has who has confirmed case of COVID. But I wouldn't say um, that I feel unsafe. And I guess I think that has a lot to do also with the fact that I have already been vaccinated. Um, I feel a little bit more at ease. But the fact that I'm alone you know, in my classroom with the door closed the majority of the day, it's not, it's not that bad. I just make sure I, you know, clean my area, use my hand sanitizer, wash my hands. That's all I can really do. Do you think Mission has taken all the necessary um, precautions to resume in-person teaching safely? Yes, I think so. Absolutely. They have, you know, phase they have different phases that they're, you know, resuming. Um, right now, they only have this. Right now, they're giving the parents the option of whether or not they want their child to attend. Right now, they're just focusing on on seniors and you know students who are at risk of not passing the school year. Um, but they have about five students in each room, and it's not many students. It's less than a hundred, so they're only occupying. They only occupy one floor. So only a couple of rooms um, and it's, you know, a teacher supervising, they have the little dividers, I think that's what they're called. Um, you know, everyone's wearing a mask, hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes. Um, every, I think like every two hours I hear this like buzzy noise where there's somebody outside my door spraying, you know, the, the door, the entrance. So you know, there's, they're, they're doing a, a really good job about that. Now to close, I'll ask you some final question. Are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in the Hidalgo area, Hidalgo County area? 
Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, I don't, I think that Hidalgo County did as much as they could do with what resources they had available. Um, like I said, this is, this was something that we never, you know, in a thousand years expected to happen. We never expected it. We never expected it to be a hot spot. We never expected it to hit so hard, you know, here. But I think that they did, you know, a good job with what resources they had available to them. Are you satisfied with the state response to COVID-19 led by Texas and Gover um, Governor Greg Abbott? I'm mixed about it. Um, I don't have a problem with him opening up Texas. I think it's necessary for us to start slowly transitioning. I also appreciate that after he announced that, you know, we're opening at 100% and masks were optional. Um, he at least made vaccines accessible to everyone who wanted to get them. Um, so I think that helped put people a little bit more at ease. However, I was reading actually just before this interview that um, that schools have not received funding that the federal government had granted them um, during the stimulus packages that states received. So there's about, um, this is not the correct number, but it's about 15, 16 billion dollars that schools have yet to receive. And the first billion dollars that the state received were not distributed to schools. That's that's a huge issue because a lot of schools are underfunded. You know, the tech getting these kids the technology so we could all be 100 percent online was a struggle. Um, even then, you know, they could definitely use an update on the devices that they're using. You know, the schools definitely need this funding. And I really, really hope that the state of Texas does better and starts distributing that money to schools because they really do need it. And it's, we already are falling behind. This is definitely something that's going to affect, you know, education here in Texas. Um, you know, they, we need this funding. So I think, that needs to be addressed for sure. It's it's still fairly new. I just you know read about it this week, and like I said, I just saw the update um, today. But yeah, that's actually you know ridiculous that the school that that Texas schools have not seen that money. Are you satisfied with the current national response um, to to COVID nineteen led by President Biden and his administration? Um, I think, I mean, I would say yes. I was very, very glad when, you know, he, he made the vaccine available to teachers because I'd been wanting to get it for a while. Um, so I was very, very excited. And as soon as it was made available to teachers, I, you know, jumped on that and all of my coworkers did as well. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I am, and I'm, I think that, you know, I will say, you know, that's something that people would compare Biden to Trump. And I know that during the elections there, you know, people would say, oh, Biden's going to do a better job, or he'd say I would do a better job than what President Trump was doing. This is something that, like I said, so there's so much uncertainty no, you know, you don't really know if you could do a better job. I think everyone's just trying to do their best, um, which I know sounds a little bit relaxed. It's, it's a relaxed statement or whatever, but I mean, I'm not really sure what more, you know, we could do when this is this was a virus that is so new to us and there's no information. And it was just kind of touch and go and learning about it as you went. 
there is an instruction manual on how to handle something like this, you know? So I would say that, yeah, he's doing, you know, a, a pretty good job. Um, they're doing as much as they possibly can. I feel like at this point, is there always room for improvement? Absolutely, 100%. Um, but there's no, there's really no way of, of knowing or telling. Do you have the power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions? What would you do differently, if anything? That's a huge responsibility to have, I think. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I would do anything differently. I mean, definitely, you know, wear a mask, social distance. I um, think I would probably um, shut down borders a lot more strictly, kind of like Canada did. Um, my boyfriend's sister lives in New Zealand. And of course, it's easier to shut down an island, you know, a small island compared to the United States. But, you know, they were very strict about it and they still are. And I know Australia is true. Um, so I think restricting the flow of people going in and out from the very beginning um, would have been a good call. But like I said, who knows if that would have worked? Because then what if you shut it down for three months? You know, and around the world, it's still spreading. And then three months later, people are allowed to fly in or, you know, travel from into the United States, you know, boom, here we are three months later. So I don't know, but I think, I think harsher restrict restrictions on definitely, you know, border security. Are there any other stories or experiences you would like to share with me that I have not asked about? Um, no, I mean, I just, all I want to say really is that this is, um, has definitely been a life-changing experience for everyone, whether or not you were personally affected in one way or another by this. I mean, everyone was affected in one way or another. Um, this is going to be very interesting to, you know, to talk to, to tell my, my kids, my grandkids one day, um, it changed so much and life is never going to be like it was before. Um, so, I mean, it's, this is definitely, I'm very glad that the university is taking time to document this because this is very important. Um, and it's something that we're still living with today but I, I mean it's already been over a year and in the beginning it felt slow and then you know in the blink of an eye it's a year later and it's like whoa you know you, sometimes <clears throat> you don't really know if you can you know sometimes you question whether or not you can get through something and then you do and then you look back at everything that happened and you're like wow you know, I was able to, to get through this. And I think during this entire time, I've tried to have a, a, a balance, um, try to do normal things, of course, with precautions, but it was just one of my, my dad, especially, you know, even he, he, he had COVID. And even now, you know, he says, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, I mean, eventually you have to start moving again. You have to start living again. You can't be living in fear. Um, we're also very lucky to not have any underlying diseases or any, any health complications that would, you know, if we got COVID would be detrimental to us. Um, however, you know, 
at least for us, at least for me, it's important for me to start trying to live um, as much of a normal life as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, I mean, this has been, and it, it's been a wild ride. The last year was insane. So yeah. Okay, so I wanna thank you for your participation, um, for doing this for the UTRGB Boss Oral History Project. And thank you again for helping me with my interview. Um, I do appreciate it and UT, I know UTRGB appreciates it as well. No, I'm, I'm definitely glad that I could be a part of this. And I, maybe they'll use some of my rants because I feel like I ran to a little bit and just went around in circles. This is just a very hard thing to talk about sometimes. And sometimes I got a little bit emotional um, just thinking back because I definitely hadn't thought about the beginning and different emotions that we, that I felt um, in the beginning and being scared and uncertain and just anxiety of it all and not knowing what life was going to look like. Um, but I'm glad that, I'm glad that we've, you know, for the most part, we've all been able, I've been able to get through this with my family. So hopefully, you know, we, we, you know, continue to be, you know, blessed with health and we can continue to move through this. But yeah, right. you're <laughs> Thank you.